Hi everyone, it's William, the host of the Engaged HR podcast. I wanted to quickly go over the announcement our president and co-founder, Shri, stated before we get into the podcast. Shri says here, my thoughts on behalf of the team at Engage Lily are that we are committed to the Black Lives Matter and Enough is Enough movements. We are pledging $10,000 to organizations that promote racial justice and equity. Comments are certainly welcome on Shri's posting. It's on LinkedIn, Facebook, it's, it's across all of our platforms um, that we are on. And if you have specific organizations you wish to nominate for this donation, um, we have a few already, but it, please nominate them. Please get in, involved in Shree's post. You can email me as well personally. It's william.miller at engagely.com um, and also comment below uh, within his post. But but we, we appreciate all, all the kind of feedback, all, all the comments and, and so on. Um, also from here, uh, we're gonna get into the podcast. It's awesome, it's, it's with Tom. Um, Tom's an incredible HR practitioner, um, but I'll, I hope you enjoy it. Welcome everybody, this is the Engage HR Podcast. Of course, this is brought to you by Engagedly, is a progressive performance management and people enablement platform. Um, what we discuss on this t uh, podcast is everything from performance management to engagement to, as always, Aaron making horrible jokes usually on the dad side of things. But I am your host, William. Let's get started. We have Tom on the podcast today. Uh, thanks, Will. How's it going, Aaron? How's everybody? I am a leadership expert, I suppose. And so what that uh, translates into is I'm a leadership professor at uh, Oakland University here just north of uh, lovely Detroit, Michigan. And um, I've been there for about 20 years. And uh, my teaching there involves uh, leadership, organizational culture, teams, organization change, that sort of thing, um, as well as your standard HR kinds of nuts and bolts. Um, I teach that at the undergrad, master's, PhD, and executive MBA levels. Primarily leadership, though, is the primary theme through all of that. And so uh, my research is all around leadership and culture and the connections to it. And, uh, you know, the things that really get me excited on research is I like looking at the connection. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist, so I always think about the individual and I'm always interested and have been interested since I first started consulting in, back in 1995 uh, about the connection between you know, a leader's personality and their values and who they are and how does that impact people and how does that impact the culture in the organization. And so, uh, you know, it's actually uh, one of the, the things um, on our list, uh, I share one interesting fact. And so I was trying to think of an interesting fact and I can never think of an interesting fact about me, right? And so I went to my wife and I said, I've got to share an interesting fact today. What, what should that be? And she says, well, why don't you talk about your research? I'm like, who wants to think about that? So I looked it up and I kind of crossed a, a threshold, uh, you know, in, in this, one of the pieces of research that I'm, I'm well known for is uh, I was the first person uh, researcher to be able to statistically connect leader personality and values. So think CEO, I worked with 33 CEOs, measured their personality and values and a couple other things. Then I measured personality and values of hundreds of people in their organizations, as well as had the people in those organizations uh, fill out some, some questionnaires about their organizational culture. And so the threshold here is that was published, uh, that was my dissertation that I converted into you know, publications. And it's now been cited over a thousand times. And when I, when I, by other scholars, other researchers interested in this, and I also found I've got four dissertations, people that I don't even know, who built their dissertation specifically around this piece of research that I did. And so it's just one of those interesting facts that, you know, a little bit of pride, like, wow, I was onto something. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so, you know, but that theme, you know, taking, looking at leaders and who they are as a person is something that really pervades who I am and everything that I do. And so whether it's my teaching, research and writing, or I've also been a, I've been a consultant for the past 25 years. I've had both internal, external staff positions as a consultant, as well as um, uh, I've had global responsibility as an organization development um, leader back in the 90s. And so, but since then, I've uh, when I went to Oakland University, I started up my own company. It's called Lead Grow Change, um, and uh, what I do with that is I really apply. Um, you know, not just my own ideas of my own research, but really I have done over the years a lot to keep myself up to date, uh, staying at the forefront of, you know, how do we understand leadership? How do we develop people? And what I know is that if there's one thing I know for sure, the way that we train and develop leaders, um, and in particular next generation leaders simply doesn't work. 
which is why I do a lot of coaching. I do a lot of consulting all around leadership. And primarily the focus is helping leaders have the kind of impact on other people, their teams and their organizations that they really want to have. And I call that owning, you know, own your leader impact. Um, and it really sets the stage for my entire coaching and consulting process. So right, we understand that you got something for our listeners, potentially maybe they can get experience with this, with this model you're working on, maybe some, some people to help you out in some of this kind of launching of, of this new service you have. What I'm working on right now, you know, as I mentioned, I've got Lead Grow Change is my consulting business. That's my face-to-face traditional boots on the ground uh, work that I do. And with COVID, you know, with everything that's been going on and listening to what my, my clients have really been asking for, uh, they've been asking for years, you know, what do you do for next generation leaders? And that's just my term for, you know, people who are currently individual contributors, they might be early careerists, whatever. Um, they're not in a leadership role yet, but they're kind of, they may be a high potential leader in your company. Um, you know, they may be just someone who's really interested in finding out what would it mean or what would it look like if I were a, a supervisor, a team leader, a manager. And I don't, I, I just have not deployed myself to that level because for me to do it and do it well, I, everything I do is customized. So I don't do cookie cutter solutions. I don't just pull things off the shelf. Everything I do, whether it's coaching one-on-one with someone, working with a team, whatever, um, I modify my approach to fit what, their, what I believe their needs are. And so when I think about trying to help next generation leaders specifically, we're talking a very large body of people versus one CEO. I'm working right now on uh, something called the Tom Guy Rissen Leadership Institute. And what it is, it's an online institute that uh, I'm, I'm just now building out. And I expect by July 1, I'm looking for some beta testers. And beta testers would be uh, people in you know, one of your clients' organizations or one of my client organizations who are potentially high potential for moving up into a leadership type of role, but they don't have that experience yet. And you really want to set the stage for that person to take ownership for their own development, their own success, and have a very clear understanding of themselves, uh, what their likely weak points and strong points will be in that first leadership role, and very specifically, their game plan, what I call a day one action plan, um, uh, will be to get themselves to be in the best position possible to jump into that role, you know, running. And so with, uh, with technology today and me getting over my discomfort with being on camera, <laughs> um, you know, I've just been, I've been really working hard to put together a solution that is going to be very affordable for whether it's an individual off the street or it's a HR executive or a manager looking for a solution for the individuals on their team to really take them through and get, I would say my goal is to get about 80% of what you would have gotten from me as a coach to get you through a very clear development planning and, and feedback intensive process through some online leadership assessments that I have. Um, I'm, my goal is to get people to about 80% there, but it's going to be so much less expensive. You're not going to miss that 20%. Absolutely. So that's what I'm working on. Uh, Tom Guyberson Leadership Institute. And my first target is those, what I call aspiring leaders. So it's those individual contributors who are looking or needing to get ready to take on that first role. We love what Tom's doing and his information is actually going to be linked in the LinkedIn post, which will be somewhere up here. Also, you can find it at www.leadgrowchange.com if you're interested. What challenges are you seeing organizations facing developing the next generation of leaders? So what are the, some of those challenges that are facing those organizations? First and foremost, it's... Um, it, it's how do you identify high potential? Um, you know, it's important that you invest your dollars and your resources smartly at any level of the organization. And so I actually, I just finished up a project for a large global uh, manufacturer. And the whole purpose was to identify what does a high potential next generation leader quote unquote look like in that company. And so I did a lot of work around personality assessments, history assessments, working with large numbers of um, you know, next generation potential leaders and so forth to help them identify exactly what that profile looks like so that they can be sure they're targeting people and trying to get them linked into the, the, this particular organization has so much they offer in terms of uh, leadership development support. But how do you get them connected to the right things and make sure it's the right people connected? And as I work through that process with them, I know very well what that profile looks like. However, when you start to get into uh, thinking about fairness and about 
some of the imprecision about measurement and so forth, you know, they really are trying to figure out an affordable way to hit on all of those people because you want to be fair. You want to give everyone a chance. You know, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, someone who is an individual contributor is okay. You know, they do a good job. They're all right, that kind of thing. But a lot of times it's that person who gets promoted up to the next level and they're an amazing leader. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Which leads yeah. to another key problem is that, uh, I mean, and I know you and your listeners have always heard the, the truism, well, we took a pretty good engineer or accountant or whatever, and then we promoted them up to a manager and they're terrible. What, what went wrong? Well, what went wrong is what it takes to lead as a manager is an entirely different, completely different set of skills that being an individual contributor doesn't, doesn't prepare you for it. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening and what I found actually in the study for this client or with this client is that um, managers believed, identified individuals as having the highest potential. Uh, they, they, it was conflated. So it was, it was seen the same as who was best at performing their current individual contributor role. Mm -hmm. So think about that. We take our best engineer, we pro promote her up and she is a terrible leader and we can't figure out why. And so again, that's another significant challenge. We have managers as a whole and organizations as a whole have a, a, an incorrect mental model of what leadership is and what it takes to be successful in those roles. And so much of what I try to do, whether it's my coaching or my aspiring leader um, program through my institute, is helping people develop and understand a much better way of thinking about what leadership is, how you can own your own leadership, your own behavior, have the impact that you want on people on your teams and that sort of thing in a more realistic way. So there's a lot of challenges around that. Um, and then uh, I think uh, just the third one I'll mention uh, that I kind of alluded to a little earlier is clients and most organizations will use off the shelf leadership training solutions. And I'm not saying they're all terrible or they're all bad or anything like that. There's a lot of good products out there. However, Training solutions, if you're going to provide a training product to a thousand people in your company who are in this next generation category, um, it's designed to hit the average, right? The average in this case, no one is going to be that average that it's designed for. You're going to have people at one end of the spectrum, other end of the spectrum. You're going to be covering stuff for some people that is so foreign and doesn't even relate to their role or what their personality is, what their natural tendencies are. You know, it's like telling people to delegate. All right. Oh, what you're going to do if you're a manager, you delegate and here's how you do it. Guess what the number one thing is that I work with top executives in very large firms. Guess what I work with them on as primary issue? Delegation. Delegation and empowerment. They know how to do this four things you can do. The, the, the base, you can look it up on the internet. It's not hard until you start to understand the psychology behind assigning work to people and the incredibly complex social structure that we have in organizations that creates problems for people. So people get in their own way. And part of my role as a psychologist and a uh, coach is to help them get out of their own way. And, you know, using feedback intensive approaches and helping people really understand what their real needs are to have the outcomes they want is where you get past, uh, you know, traditional training models where we're going to put everyone in a classroom for eight hours. And instead, I believe we should be spending our dollars in feedback intensive programs that allow people, whether next generation or not, to get a lot of self-reflection going on, to take ownership for who they are, their behavior, learn a, a, a productive, positive model of leadership that they can own and really implement such that they are looking at things more clearly and understanding the importance of um, you know, everything from as small as the words they choose to their tone of voice, to who they connect with, don't connect with, how often they touch, but all these different things have an impact on relationships. And leadership, in my belief, the oversimplification of the world by Tom Guyverson, is leadership. <laughs> leadership is about relationships, period, period. So, um, you know, so really getting, now think about that statement. In my experience, some of the, the best CEOs should have one of the easiest jobs in the company. I hate to say that, but it's true. If they do their job right, they should be making decisions not very often because they have people for that. What yeah. they should be doing and the most effective CEOs in my experience are the ones that spend their time on relationships and everything that that encompasses, removing barriers, building uh, collaboration and uh, you know, consortiums among people in the organization, trying to bring people at all levels closer in to feel a part of the organization. That's what they should be doing. Yeah. 
uh, the CEOs that I end up coaching and having problems, they're working 80, 90 hours a week. The first question I ask any CEO that I may coach is how many hours a week you're working. If they say more than 50, that tells me that they're doing someone else's job. And as it turns out, almost 100% of the time, what's happening is their team is delegating up to them rather than them delegating down to their team and holding them accountable. Yeah. And so take that next generation leader, complexity of what I just described simply around delegating, put them through a training course, put them in that first management role and wonder why they're not delegating. Well, it's because they have psychological blocks, if you will, that they need to understand and identify and let go of so that they can feel comfortable empowering and delegating to people. Um, and without that self-reflection, self-understanding, they're going to end up calling me or someone like me 15 years from now, and I'm going to help them address something that I firmly believe that I can help them deal with right now before they even start their, their first role. Um, and there aren't a lot of things out there that do it. So it's not all about my product, but I'm just, you know, this is something that I get excited about and passionate about because the things that I really enjoy getting involved with are one, things that deal individually one-on-one -on -one with people or in small groups um, and uh, having a real impact, you know, seeing a difference that, you know, when I coach somebody, there are times where I fire myself because I, it's not being, we're not effective together. It's not mm -hmm. a good fit. Yeah. It, it's not a fault thing, mine or theirs. It's just, this isn't working. And I help them find someone else. Um, but where there's a good fit and, you know, um, we're able to work well together. I, I've had, I can't tell you how many clients tell me, and this is the most satisfying thing in the world. I had one client recently, he was a global director of R and D for another uh, Japanese owned uh, um, uh, tier one supplier. And he said, Tom, you know, my wife is so happy that you're doing this with me and I'm engaged in this. He said, He's calling it my better person project. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if you start taking responsibility for yourself and the impact you have on other people at work, how do you not then take that into account and consideration when you go home or in your friendship or in the world around you and not think about, geez, if I, I could, how could I say this in such a way or do a thing in such a way that we're all, I'm bringing people closer together to me. We're moving in the same direction rather than me judging or pushing you down or judging you or whatever else. That's not leadership. That's creating divisiveness and division. Mm -hmm. Leaders are, are, should be developing strong, high quality relationships with others. So try to get that through to a, <laughs> a new manager who can't understand why what they, what they know how to do isn't working. I think you make some good points there. I think I liked when you said the executive, I forgot who, who, who had stated that, right? The executive, the key, like that executive is successful. Only one or two decisions a year, right? Good yeah, decisions. Absolutely. I mean, they'll make, they'll make or break the company, but Ultimately, that's, that, that's really, it's indicating, it's highlighting your ability to delegate, your ability to step back and really to, you know, make those decisions where most needed. As you think about, our listeners kind of vary across the spectrum. You know, we have some that leadership development and developing their next gen leaders is part of their role. And this role could be, they're managing like everything. So if you had to distill down to something really actionable in terms of the advice that you gave them to get started, um, what advice would you give, give them as they start to think about getting started to better prepare and develop next generation of leaders? What would be those one or two things that you'd say, this will get you started, just start here. And that seems right. pretty, pretty actionable to them. So I'll put it in, in kind of fairly HR technical terms, how I would, how I think about it and literally the process that I have used to, to design uh, the work, you know, the, the things that I provide my clients. I think the first step is to really look at what the leadership look like. And we'll just talk about next gen leaders. So what does leadership really look like in that first entry level position? And what I mean by that is what are the role requirements? So just think job analysis, that sort of thing, but being a little bit more, uh, I like the language of success profile in this case. And what I mean by that is, you know, what are they responsible for and what kind of behaviors, what kind of competencies, you know, should they do, do they need to be able to, uh, to deploy in order to do them in a way that is consistent with our culture, with our company values um, and, with, you know, with the people in our organization. And so once you have a good understanding of, of now what, what success looks like, now what you can do is you can start and it doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, you know, part of my role as a consultant and the things that I do is to have, you know, ways of doing individual or large scale assessments, but to, you don't have to do it that way. It's talking with people, it's meeting with managers, it's meeting with potential next gen leaders and asking them say, you know, what are your interests? Are you interested? What path do you want to go down? And in some organizations, the only way to grow and you know, move your career forward is down a leadership path versus what a lot of my clients have been helping them do is to try to make technical 
you know, paths just as, uh, mm -hmm. just as appealing and rewarding in, in as many ways as possible. So you don't get that phenomenon of, you know, you want people to self-select out with, if, boy, looking at what it takes to be a manager, that's not me. And I don't want to do mm -hmm. what it takes to get there, but I want to have a career that grows. So there could be a technical path. So anyway, back to, um, you know, that next step is talking with people. What are their interests? What gets them excited? What kinds of, um, you know, things do they like to do outside of work that might give you some clues about their leadership potential. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that you listen and connect, you're not only relationship building with them, you're leading. You're also role modeling what you want them to be doing if they end up in a leadership role, which is building one-on-one -on -one and group level relationships with people toward a common goal. So once you can understand who they are, where they are, what they're willing to do, if it is, if they do want to go down a leadership path, now you can have a conversation and this can be conversation driven boy, this is what it takes to be uh -huh. an effective leader in our organization because you've already got that information, right? Now you can have a conversation, put it in front of them, say, you know, which of these things do you think you'd be good at? Which of these things kind of give you some, oh man, I don't know if I can do that or I don't even know what that means. You know, half the battle is that, um, you know, if you go and look at what are, you know, what are the typical responsibilities of an entry level leader and versus uh, say just, I just keep saying an engineer because I'm in Detroit, but you know, think of uh, <laughs> responsibilities for uh, an engineer, right? And the two job descriptions are they're completely unrelated Absolutely. other than it might say engineering manager in there but the tasks the duties the responsibilities have almost nothing to do with engineering you could replace it with accounting you replace it with any other word so it's not about the engineering per se right um so you know having that conversation with people and you know it could get a little unwieldy in a large company but in smaller companies you know that can be an incredibly powerful way for hr people to to be a true business partner and to not just be, you know, I have so many clients where they get characterized as, you know, the people, the person you don't want coming to your office on a Friday, right? <laughs> Use the tools that we have, build those connections. And what you also are doing, one of the most important things that I think that I do with, with organizations is you can be that role model for the managers, not just for the next gen, but with the managers. You can help them understand what you're doing and why and how you're going about doing it and give them feedback on what you learned about people on their team or, you know, whatever the case may be. And um, you're role modeling them a way to lead, a way to connect with people, a way to listen, a way to pull people in to something rather than just kind of say, this is your job today, go get it done. You know, every time that I coach somebody, unless it's the CEO, I am always convinced that I'm coaching the wrong person. It is the next level up that I should be coaching because oftentimes the reason Susan is having a difficult time in her role and needs a coach is because her boss, Lucy, isn't doing her job and holding her accountable, giving her feedback and letting her know what she's doing well and, and not doing well and really trying to truly lead her. And so I get asked to come in to a lot of situations to do the manager's job and I do it. <laughs> you know, I, I end up having to spend time with the manager to coach them on what they need to do in order to support Susan to be more successful. And so I, I use that as an example of what HR folks can be doing is not only helping next generation leaders, but the, the true intervention here is helping their bosses become better bosses. And again, one way to do it is to be engaged, be that business partner and, and demonstrate how to do some of these things that a lot of them frankly aren't good at. Because a lot of them were the good engineer they got promoted. Obviously, Tom, you exude kind of like this, this passion and knowledge for the space and, and kind of for this, for this path. And you touched on it a little bit briefly, but throughout your career and, and, and everything, what type of work have you found the most rewarding and why? Well, I think it, it goes back to that, um, the one-on-one -on -one coaching or, you know, one, uh, something that, uh, anything that I'm able to be one-on-one -on -one with someone and really making a difference. That is very satisfying to me. It energizes me. It's motivating to me. Um, and when it can also benefit the organization in a powerful way, one service I provide my clients is I do deep psychological assessments. Um, interviews and sometimes simulations and that sort of thing. And then I, I write up one or two, one of two models, either a developmental assessment of uh, an individual that leads them down. What, what do they need to develop? Strengths, weaknesses, why, what's behind it? What's their, what do they need to do to develop? That's one path that I go. Another path is a pre-hire. So you've got two finalists for a CEO role. You want a psychologist to come in and let you know what's behind door number one and door number two. I do that. And that's, I've done that over 3,000 times in the past 20 years. And so I've had that time of interviewing one-on-one -on -one with people from the director level all the way up to CEOs. And, you know, it's not the, 
fact, oh, I'm working with a CEO. That doesn't get me excited. I've been doing that, like I said, since I was about 24 years old. It's not that. They're just people and they're more human than most people actually recognize and realize. Um, and so uh, doing that, helping a, a, a person fit into the right company, saying, you know, to tell the client that, um, yep, they're a great fit. They're going to be, you know, it looks like here's a couple things that the manager might need to do to help successfully onboard them and so forth. What I've just done is, is eliminated some of the, the risk of that hire. I have made it very clear uh, where the culture fit is, where some challenges might be. I have made it very clear for how their boss, again, unless they're the CEO, what, what their boss can do to best build relationship, get them set up for success. You know, I've not only impacted that individual person's life, um, but I've also impacted that organization because I am absolutely 99% confident that this is the right person, <laughs> you know? And for the person that didn't get the job, let's say there's two people, I believe, I, I, th I think of them as a client of mine too, because I don't want to put someone into a role in a company, in a, in a culture that they're not a fit for. Yeah. There's nothing more miserable than waking up every day and realizing you've got to go into that office or whatever. And, oh my God. Yeah. If I get, if this job was just in a different company, you know, everyone has examples in their life of they've had that job. Well, I believe, and I know for a fact, I stop people from having to have that terrible experience and move themselves across the country only to find out this is terrible. You'd be able to step back at a more of a macro level and, and kind of look in on what you've done, your philosophy. How would you, um, how would you define that perspective or approach that you take towards developing leadership? Uh, with some of your clients or some of these organizations you work with? As I mentioned, everything I do is custom, you know, so whether that's the assessment I do, you know, the, out, the output is, uh, you know, I've done it over 3000 times and every single one of those assessments was unique and custom written by me um, as one example. Uh, another example, something that I've come to over the past, I don't know, five or so years, a lot of my, my thinking is coalesced around certain theories, certain practices, and a lot of it from the experiences that I've, I've had just because I've been doing this so often, so many times in so many ways. Most of the way I frame the work that I do now, whether it's a, a leader, a leadership team, or, or really a, a, an organization in many ways in their culture, is I work, and I, we don't have a, a graphic up here, but you know, I, I have a visual way of demonstrating this, but the whole idea is that, you know, your behavior, and it's like the self-fulfilling prophecy, if you're familiar with that, but it, it builds yeah. on that in different ways. So here's the leader's behavior, okay? And that's everything the person says and does and how they say and do it. And oddly enough, the things they don't do and say, which we can talk about if we need to. Then <laughs> over here is, so the leader is behaving, right? They're doing stuff. Well, down here, part of the triangle is that's the impact they're having on other people. And I, I, I encourage leaders and I, the, my coaching model, a lot of my consulting model builds on this concept of, you know, here's your behavior. It has an impact on people and it impacts what people think, what they feel and what they do. Right. And so based upon what your, I call that the leader impact. So based upon your behavior, you have a leader impact. You know, one model is a lot of leaders don't understand truly what their impact is on people. That's three sixties can do it. Personality assessments and other types of things can do it. And so, um, kind of a level one here and what I do with the aspiring leader program is I simply help people understand what is their likely going to be as a leader based upon their personality and their motives as a leader. I can tell them what it is based upon their assessment results. You know, I don't need to wait for them to, to get in roll and screw it up and bring me in to help them. I can give them a preview of what that's probably going to look like and they can compare, you know, what it is they would like their impact to be on people, right? What they want people to think, feel, and do as a result of their leadership behavior mm -hmm. compared to what it's likely to be. Well, now we've got a gap, right? Because there's always a gap. There's always stuff we can improve. And uh, what I love about that is at the aspiring leader level, kind of lower levels, what I do is it's simply self-awareness building. So they can take ownership for their behavior and their choices. I focus a lot on choices with my clients. You know, it, you know, it's, I don't want to make it sound like kids, but, you know, I always tell my kids, make good choices, right, as a joke. What I hear a lot in organizations and people that use some of the typical personality assessments like the DISC or the MBTI, which I don't, I don't use either one of those, um, but, you know, say, well, I'm a D, so this is just the way I am, deal with it. Or, oh, you know, Aaron, he's a D, so this is what it's going to be like, and oh, and he can't help it, he's just an S, or he's an INTJ, and so, you know, don't expect him to do that. Well, guess what is happening right here? We've got a social system that is 
reinforcing and creating a reality. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy at work is what that becomes. Mm -hmm. So if I think you're an introvert, well, I'm not going to reach out to you as often because I don't want to bother you. So yeah. what that does is it reinforces the perception that you're really introverted, right? Mm -hmm. And guess what? Your behavior of not reaching, let's say I'm the, I'm the introvert, and, which I'm married, by the way, um, until I get passionate about something. Um, <laughs> doesn't reach out to me very often because doesn't want to bother me, thinks it might fluster me or whatever else. Well, guess what? That impacts me. That impacts how I, what I think, how I feel, and the things that I do. So what do I think? Well, geez, maybe my boss doesn't think I'm doing a good job because I never hear from him much unless he needs something or has to give me some negative feedback, makes me feel isolated, makes me feel, you know, not part of the team. What does it make me do? It makes me further withdraw and pull away when what leaders should be doing is finding ways to pull in. I help people understand what their impact is. And then the third piece of that triangle is what I, I just call performance outcomes. And so, you know, leader behavior directly relates to results or performance outcomes, you know, what our product, our service, the quality, quantity, all that kind of stuff. But so does, obviously, your your people, you know, the, the impact that you have leads people to think, feel, do certain things that are either going to lead to positive, high quality performance outcomes or not. Mm -hmm. And so at the center of that triangle, what I, what I have in there uh, in my model is it's the quality or strength and quality of relationships because the stronger, more positive those re relationships are between leaders and followers, meaning that not only are leaders having the impact on followers, their think, feel, do that is positive, productive, and, and moving towards our shared goals, um, but also that encourages the, the self-fulfilling prophecy the other way, where people respond in kind in positive, productive ways, and it creates a culture of positivity, of uh, mutual support, accountability for one's behavior and the impact they have on people. And at that point, the, the performance outcomes naturally start to happen because you are minimizing all of the nastiness and, you know, uh, avoidant behavior, not holding people accountable, not being open and honest and vulnerable with people. All those things that pull away from building relationships is what I really try to help people embed into their, uh, into their leadership. Um, and I, I take that model, I've used it with individuals, with teams, and I'm working with a client right now on, on a two to three year change project involving onboarding a new CEO, um, setting a, a new strategy. It's a bank, so a new strategy for the bank, um, and then implementing that strategy. I've been with them for a year and a half, and I'll probably be there another year and a half. And I'm using that leader impact model as a way to frame everything that the leader, or the CEO and the leadership team do so that they have a very simple way um, to understand and manage and take control of their behavior, because that's what it's all about. Regardless if you're a D or not, guess what? Mm -hmm. You can make choices <laughs> to do things differently to get the impact that you really should be having on people. And if you can't do that, get help. Because in the long run, if you can't do that, you're going to be looking for a different job because that's what it is. The behaviors, we make it sound so easy, but that is, that is not, you know, behavior change. Oh, it's change. incredibly difficult. One of the keys that people either don't understand or they don't, they do it, but they don't recognize it is that it's far easier to change your environment than you. So let's just take a very simple example. And there's tons of research to back this up, by the way. So and this is based on a piece of research. So um, I have this challenge. I'm very fortunate. I got very lucky in the, the gene pool. My Swedish parent or mother and I'm thin, you know, I mean, I could put on weight, but I just, I just, I'm lucky. You know, I, I it's, I'm able to, to maintain a pretty healthy weight without a lot of work. As I'm almost 50, it does take a little more work now, but my wife and I are very different. She can go and buy like brownies and she loves to bake and she makes sweets and everything, but she's the person that can go in there and just eat one Oreo or one brownie or even take 10 bites out of one Oreo, where to me, Oreos are a mass consumption thing, you know, or brown. It's like, and I'll, every time I walk past it, if it's out on the counter kitchen, guess what? I'm taking an Oreo or whatever, right? Like, oh my gosh, I have no self-discipline. What's the problem here? <laughs> yeah. you know, but I started thinking about it. And again, I, I, I didn't invent this, but um, you know, there's actually research on this very topic. Um, guess what we do? I had to say to Kim, I said, listen, can we, I'd love that you have these in the house because I do like to have a treat once in a while, but if we can just put it in, in, the, count, or in the cupboard. So I'm not walking past it and seeing it on the counter. <laughs> you know, change your environment. And guess what? If that's what happens, I might have a couple cookies 
in the evening three times a week rather than half a dozen to a dozen every night of the week if they're sitting on the counter. Change your environment, you're going to change your outcomes. And it's no different. That's a very simple example, but it works, by the way. Uh, before Kim and I were together, which you know, it's been almost 10 years now, but um, you know, my solution was I just didn't buy sweets. I didn't buy yep. sugar. I, I control the environment by not having the house. You know what I mean? But she likes to have it in the house and, that's and she has self-control, <laughs> right? <laughs> so my self-control in the, in the former was to just not buy it. Don't bring it in the house. If you don't have it, you can't eat it. Now it's like, let's have it, but let's just, can we just put it away so Tom doesn't have to sit there and fight himself all day long? So that's a simple example, but it gets the, the further the you go in life, you know, the same principle applies in relationships that you choose to get in or not, in jobs you choose to have or not. If you don't, if you're not happy at work, if you don't like it, you know, we get use the example of being in the wrong culture, wrong organization, bad boss, whatever the case may be. Well, you can either try to change yourself and your attitude and your mindset and your choices of how you process things. And there are tools and techniques to do just that, that work very, very well. However, it's a lot easier in the long run to find a different job, move to a different part of the organization, to be in a place where you're more of a fit so that being who you are more naturally you can just be who you are and fit in. Some people, that's very difficult to find those things, right? And that's, you know, takes a lot of work. But that's what I mean by if you want quick change, you change your environment, not yourself. I mean, you imagine when you're not, you're in an organization, you're working and you don't fit. It doesn't feel good. Right? It's terrible. You, you're trying so hard and you're, everything's, a, you're pushing against something. And, you know, sometimes people think that defines them too in the work that they do. I mean, they internalize that, that defines them. Then, then they feel like they've, I can't, I can't succeed. I can't achieve. Right. But you, then they go find that position where they do fit and literally, I mean, there's that opportunity and they really can succeed and they do have those qualities and they can be a good performer. And uh, mm -hmm. it's amazing. They, you know, it's sometimes we get in our, we're in our own way. I always say, save myself from myself with the cookies right. example. <laughs> I know yeah. I was saying, we're like, ah, you know, put the cookies in there. One of the things that's really, <laughs> really interesting concept that um, I didn't come up with, but it's, it's incredibly uh, powerful and, very true. I learned this from a brilliant developmental psychologist named Robert Keegan. Uh, some of your listeners may be familiar with the immunity change process and all that kind of stuff. Well, I went to Harvard for uh, a week uh, a few years ago. To, uh, not with him. I did meet him, um, uh, Bob Keegan. It was actually his last day at Harvard. He was retiring. And I took a, a course on um, the subject object interview, which I will get into, but it's the precursor of his um, immunity to change process. And, you know, one of the things that I learned reading his stuff and, and when I think about it is, you know, one of the big challenges of helping people, you know, whether it's a coach helping a leader or a counselor helping a person is really trying to figure out what it is they really want. Okay. Uh, well, I want to have, I'm just going to use a, like a life example outside of work. I want to have a healthy, positive, fulfilling relationship with my significant other. That's what I really want. Okay. So then the real question here is, to figure out how, what are they willing to do to not get it and how far will they go to not get it? What I mean by that is if that's what you want, right? Let's go back to my model, my impact model. Let's take a look at your behavior. If you want to have a help, happy, healthy, positive relationship with your significant other, what are the things, let's go to the think, feel, do, the impact zone and say, what is it that you're, I'll just say for me, it's my wife. What would you want Kim to think, feel, and do if it were a, what was she, what would those things be if this is a positive, healthy, productive, blah, blah, blah relationship? Well, I would want her to feel, think, feel, and do these things. Okay, well, that sounds great. It sounds like that would be a part of a ha her half of a happy, healthy relationship. Let's take a look at your behavior. Does your behavior encourage and help it create that impact? Or does your behavior do something else and create a different think, feel, do? The helper, in this case, counselor or coach, whatever, can help that person examine what are the behaviors, what are the choices you're, you're, you're using, what, what choices you're making, and how you interact with, talk to, treat, ignore, engage with, you know, and how you do those things. Is that leading to the think, feel, do that you want? And I already can tell the answer, no, it's not. Why? Because you're getting on your own way. You know what I mean? If that's what you really, really want, and you can examine your own life, and I can have this conversation with anybody, and I can help you see that you are the reason that you're not getting what you want at work or in your love life or in your friendships or your you know, relationship with your kids, whatever it else, you, assuming you have positive goals and outcomes that are healthy and, and you know, productive and, and growth oriented, 90% of the reason that you're not getting what you want out of it has nothing to do with the other person, it's you. 
And the beauty of that is, and it's another core tenet of all the work that I do, is you can't control 99% of the stuff that's out there. You can influence a few things. The only thing that you can control and make choices over literally are your behaviors that you choose to deploy day by day, moment by moment. Sometimes it's really hard to bite your tongue, but you've done it before. If you don't do it now, you're making a choice to not do it now. You know, there's a classic example or a great example of um, a mother yelling at a kid and, you know, the kid did something naughty. So yelling, 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 the phone rings, she picks up the phone and it turns out to be her boss. And so her tone and everything instantly changes to the, this is how I talk to my boss tone, right? No anger, just this and that professional, da, 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 hangs up the phone and immediate flips back to yelling at the kid. You're telling me that mother couldn't have chosen a different way to talk to the boss and yell at him too, or made a choice to not yell at the kid and find a more productive way to get the think, feel, do that they want rather than yelling, screaming, spanking, whatever the solution may be, which is pushing them away rather than bringing them in. You know, yeah. if that's your goal, if people are not coming into you, my experience and the, the, the way that I work with people is you have a lot, you can't totally control it, but you can do far more than you ever imagined in order to get that outcome that you really want, as long as you're willing to take the, the, the self-reflection, the self-look and look in the mirror and um, identify the ways that you yourself are the reason you're not getting what you want. And that's really that, that underlying philosophy pervades everything that I do um, and really how I try to approach my own life personally and professionally and, you know, everything else. And it's not always easy, you know, but being responsible and making choices about yourself rather than making excuses and just saying, well, this is, I'm a, I'm an introvert or I'm, I'm not agreeable. And, and so I just I mean to people, well, you have done it before where you weren't. So just do that. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> that little sound bite has just transcended all of like the HR topics. And it's, that's an amazing, I think it's an amazing snippet. Just, it just in general, but Tom, what are your, what are your final thoughts or words of wisdom you would, you would want to share? I think what I would say, you know, and again, I'm going to assume your HR, you know, HR leaders primarily are, are, are listening. Um, you know, I work a lot with people in HR and like I described earlier, too often, too often we get pigeonholed into that you know, it's just, you're just, the, I mean, you know, you're in trouble when HR shows up, right? Regardless of what your reputation is or HR's reputation is in your organization, okay? There have been a series of choices that you may or may not have been responsible for. You may have inherited this reputation and this, you know, whatever HR is seen as, if it's not what you want, well, try to think about that model I just shared. You know, what is it that we as an HR organization do compared to, and what impact does it have on people? What does it cause them to think, feel, do? And how does that impact our performance outcomes collectively as, a, as an organization, as a team, as you know, professionals, all that good stuff? And if you, I guarantee you, if you, let's say you wanted people to think, feel, do things like, I want them to think of HR as a business partner, as a strategic partner. I want people to feel like um, HR um, has their back and is here to support managers and employees you know, when they need it with, challenges, whatever, you know, uh, do uh, people to, to uh, think of HR and um, every time that there's important decisions to be made that HR is at the table. I want them to actively invite us in. Well, okay. So if that's your think, feel, do, that's the impact you want to have. You can do this for yourself as an HR leader. You can do this with your team. You know, think of it as an organization, as a living, breathing organization. What are our behaviors that we are demonstrating as individuals and as a team and as an HR function, you know, if you can accept thinking of the function as human enough to have behaviors. But let's think about this. I have a, a HR executive that's part of this bank team that I work with. And I was working with her on this stuff the other day on a, on a coaching call, going through this process that's, that I'm now baking into my, my new uh, uh, aspiring leader program. And uh, she came to realize that she fits into that category of, you know, HR only shows up when there's a problem, right? And you don't want them showing up at your door. And I asked her, uh, I'll just call her Susan. I'll say, Susan, well, let's talk about what you do. Let's talk about your behaviors and stuff. I said, you know, um, what, is mo what are most people's interactions with you and the people on your team? And she kind of went like this and thought about it and <laughs> said, well, you asked the question. The only time they see us is when there's a problem and we have to go and discipline, fire, put them on a pip. And I said, okay, so if that's the only time they see you, what is the very reasonable, rational, think, feel, do, impact response to that? And it's exactly matches the reputation 
that her HR program has or her department has. So what does she go, what's Susan going to start doing differently? What I'm working with her on is uh, identifying ways that she can personally as an HR executive start building the relationships across the organizations at multiple locations and branches of the bank and start reaching out to and being accessible, literally going physically when COVID allows it um, and start doing something she's never done. She's been there for 20 years, never done this. Uh, going out and meeting with people and just going and spending a day at a branch and working from there so that she can be a part and be visible and be human and not just the person that shows up to fire somebody. And um, so this was just last week. So our next co call is next week. And I'm, my first question will be, how many places did you touch? How many people did you touch? Um, and that's the accountability mechanism here to help her out. But I guarantee you that quick self-reflection, that one question that she had never even thought of, all she was doing was complaining about the reputation that she and her team had and as a, just a paper pusher, punisher. It's like, well, what are you doing to counter that? I mean, this is not hard, but it's very hard as a person to reflect if you don't have good support to enable that to happen, um, to hold that mirror up to you and help you process what you see in such a way that you feel that you can actually change what you're seeing. Right. You know, really look at what you want strategically the think, feel, do's from yourself and your HR team, and then take some time. It'd be a great half day session for you and your team to just sit down with some paper and pencil and start brainstorming. What is it that the organization sees of us? And if they only see what they would connotate you know, or connote as negative, then that's going to be reflective in your reputation and the impact you have versus what are, you have to do those things. That's your role. But there's so much more you can do. Do those things too to counterbalance it and round out you know, the impact that you're having, which is completely, it will completely revolutionize and change the impact that you're having um, and the performance outcomes of your organization and your, um, your function. So that's not a quick snippet. <laughs> <laughs> hey. It's going to make them think. I spend my days doing nothing pretty much but thinking and talking with people about my thoughts and, and trying to get theirs out. So this yeah. is just another day in my, well, yeah. it was an absolute privilege to be invited. And um, it's, it is, this is my very first time being interviewed about this kind of stuff, about anything like this, other than, um, you know, by students or something like that in a yeah. job talk. Leadgrowchange.com is where you can find, find Tom, Tom's services. You can also reach out to me, you can reach out to Aaron, you can also reach out to Tom himself. Aaron Adams, partner in Engage League, William Miller, director of sales and enablement. We appreciate your time. And then also Tom. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Be well. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye, everybody.